Today is going to be all about you. We talk a lot about at these conferences through a lot of really, really great content about how to optimize your company, how to optimize your team, how to optimize your team under these circumstances or those circumstances. But for at least the next 20 minutes, what we're going to unpack um, is really working on you as a founder or an executive or just as a human being in this you know, big, bad world of SaaS. Um, and the reason that this is so important is that if you really think about your company, or at least what I've learned in studying a bunch of companies and ultimately you know, running a company myself, is that your team and your culture and your vision is oftentimes going to be very emblematic of you as a human being. And so if you continue to scale, if you have good habits, if you get rid of some of those bad habits, inevitably what's going to happen is, is that your company is going to get rid of some of those bad habits, is going to scale, et cetera. And so, the two big lessons that we're going to talk about, finding leverage and seeking truth. Uh, these are two lessons that I have found have been really, really helpful for me, and in studying other really, really successful companies have also been found to be really, really successful. We're going to go through some data, we're going to go through a bunch of slides, and so if you want the data or want the slides, patrick at profitable.com is where you can get those. But to kind of kick things off here, I want to give you a little bit of a background of you know, who the heck am I, where do I kind of come from. Um, my personal background is in econometrics and math. Uh, so I started my career working in US intelligence, and then I worked at Google, um, basically building giant models with a bunch of data in order to find some sort of outcome. Um, so at NSA, finding bad guys and gals, you know, at Google, finding money, um, interestingly, using the exact same types of models. Um, but that's another talk for another day. Um, then about seven years ago, I started a company called ProfitWell. And at ProfitWell, we basically plug into your subscription billing system and do a couple of magic things. Um, we give you free subscription financial metrics, so access to all of your fun churn metrics, segmentation, revenue, those types of things. And then in addition to that, the way we make money is we have a couple of products to help with your churn, help with your pricing, et cetera. Um, we have two pretty big success metrics because we're a freemium model. Um, first is some sort of metric on the free plan. Um, and right now we have about $10 billion in SaaS and subscription revenue under management, the revenue of all of our users. Um, and then we've also crossed about $10 million in revenue um, on our way to 25. Um, we've done that all with about 85 people um, in Boston, Argentina, and now Salt Lake City. Um, and we've done that with $0 in funding, um, which is great. And anyone who tells you about a bootstrapper, they say, oh my god, that's really, really amazing that you were you know, able to do that. Um, but don't let anyone ever convince you that there isn't a cost to bootstrapping. Um, this is what I used to look like. Um, and I'm the guy on the right, just to be super clear. Um, and now I look like this. So there is a cost. There's definitely a cost. But let's kick things off here. It's OK to laugh at me, OK? There's going to be a lot of self-deprecating humor here. So first up, let's talk about leverage. And this is one that I've at least found to be extremely important, especially as a very, very ROI-driven slash resource-constrained company. And even if you are a venture-backed company, you're resource-constrained no matter you know, your situation or how much money you've raised. And what I found in kind of studying myself over the last seven years, but also studying a lot of companies and having lots of fun founder and CEO friends, is that a lot of us have very, very little background or frameworks when it comes to actually understanding and increasing our leverage. And what I mean by leverage is using as you know, little or using as creative of resources in order to get some sort of an outcome. Because oftentimes what happens is in our business, there are so many different things that happen that are really, really good, and there are so many things that happen are really, really bad. And the cycle that we typically follow when these bad things happen is what I like to call the breakout cycle of executive emotion. So first off, something bad happens. And then all of a sudden, after that bad thing happens, we go, this is important, right? It doesn't matter if it's a support ticket that didn't get answered properly, or if it's some big bad thing that you know, a competitor just raised a bunch of funding. But a bad thing happens, and we automatically go, this is important. I need to drop everything, and I need to go fix it right now, right? And then all of a sudden, what ends up happening is no matter what the bad thing is, we go, fuck, right? It's the reverberation of fuck that I like to call it, which basically means we sit there and we go, everything's going to fail, everything is going to be really, really bad. 
And so the next thing we do is then we go, okay, cool. I'm smart, I'm really driven, I'm ambitious, I wanna solve this problem. So instead of pausing, thinking about things, we just throw something up against the wall and hope it sticks, and we guess and check our way to a solution. We may yell at that person who we're upset with, we may just randomly respond to that support ticket just trying to get it out of the way, because we don't want to deal with that freak out that we're going through when it comes to that emotion and that reverberation. And then all of a sudden what happens though is because we move too quickly, that guess and check doesn't work, so we guess and check again, then all of a sudden that doesn't work, and then all of a sudden the failure mentality starts to fall into place where everything's never going to be good again and we're never gonna smile ever again in our business. Then we guess and check again, guess and check again, guess and check again, and eventually something works, right? And we go, great, we solved the problem, everything's amazing, we're going to be so successful going forward, right? The problem is, is that when we freaked out, when we maybe yelled at that person when we shouldn't have, when we maybe acted a little bit too quickly, all of a sudden what happens is we have unintended consequences, right? That person that you, know, you yelled at who wasn't doing their job or you just weren't really respectful of, now you have a relationship problem. That actually starts another problem within this cycle and you continue to kind of freak out more and more. And so what I've kind of found at being someone who is still incredibly impatient but maybe didn't handle that patience as well as you know, I should have previously is that the model that I like to use is this breakout cycle rather than the freakout cycle where essentially something bad happens and we actually question it, right? We're like, there's so many bad things that are gonna happen. Of course we don't have to fix everything, right? And there's a lot of these things that you're still gonna do nothing and you're still gonna freak out a little bit because everything's terrible and you need to be better. But all of a sudden you've given yourself a little bit of an opportunity to not deal necessarily with those really, really small problems, but ultimately go after those bigger problems, think about them, create some sort of a framework to understand those particular problems, and then ultimately decide what you should do, monitor and adjust that solution that you put into play, and eventually you're gonna solve that problem. Right? Now the issue is, is that you're still gonna have some of those unintended consequences that happen, but you've at least given yourself some space to think and to framework about the problem. Now this all sounds really, really easy in theory, correct? But in practice, we're going through those reverberations essentially as an emotional human being, and we can't just like turn things off like Spock, right? To solve all of these problems really, really dispassionately. And so what I've found is not necessarily getting rid of that emotion or kind of dampening that emotion, but instead making sure that you actually have an order of operations when things happen. And no matter if there's a really, really big thing that you're having a problem with, like growth is slowing for the third quarter in a row, or you have something that's super, super small, like that support ticket that I mentioned, basically taking the time to think and to framework. And the framework that I really, really like to use is something called problem cause solution. And the reason this works really, really well is because oftentimes what happens with a problem is we freak out as we just kind of talked about. The issue there is that we can't actually solve a problem. You can only really solve the causes of a problem. So if we take world hunger, for example, we all can probably agree that world hunger isn't a great thing and we want to solve that problem. But in reality, that problem is made up of multiple different causes, right? Don't have right irrigation, aid isn't getting to the right place, and a whole myriad of different things. But if we take that problem and we break it down into the different causes, we then can basically align those particular solutions to those causes, and we can actually evaluate and find out that different causes have greater weight on those problems that we're going after. And if we get into a cycle with these problems that are big and small within our business, of instead of just going and throwing something up against the wall, but taking a step back and going, cool, let's relax a second, we still might be freaking out and that's totally fine, but sitting there and going, awesome, let's go through this framework, let's write it down, let's just think through it, and then figure out what the proper solution is to the largest cause so we can push things forward. And I got an example for you because I understand that this might not be a way that you're always thinking consciously all the time. All of you are doing this, not necessarily 100% of the time, this is just being a rational human, that's really what it comes down to. But oftentimes when we're in the heat of the motion, emotion becomes really, really difficult. So this is an example from ProfitWell. 
Um, and at ProfitWell, we started off as a company called Price Intelligently with a piece of pricing software that moved into what's called a tech-enabled service. But about two years into the business, we were helping a company that was about to IPO with their pricing, and we discovered as this outside vendor that they were calculating their MRR completely incorrectly. And so there was a CFO who had taken two other companies public. This was his third company, and he was calculating MRR completely wrong. And so we got super, super excited. We were like, this is it. We're going to create this product. It's going to be analytics for subscription companies. We're going to get Ferraris. We're going to get yachts. It's going to be awesome, right? And this is the product we came out with. Um, yeah, this is what happens when Patrick designs a product, just to be super clear. Um, and you can bet your ass that it is a piggy bank logo up in the upper left-hand corner. And you're totally right that when you scrolled over that piggy bank logo, that coin did drop into that piggy bank. And this is what it looks like today, because I'm really insecure about what I designed back in the day. But what happened, as some of you probably know, is that on our journey to you know, being the leader in the space here, we were super, super excited. And all of a sudden, as we were pushing things out, and we started to kind of quote unquote launch, everyone kind of came back to us and said, oh, have you heard of this, this company called Bear Metrics? They do this. They're trying to do this. They started like two weeks ago, but like they're doing this as well. And then all of a sudden, along this entire journey, a company called Chartmogul came out, a bunch of other companies came out, and because we were all building on Stripe initially, there were 35, 36, 37 different companies that all were as brilliant as we were in our genius idea to be billionaires, basically. And to kind of make matters worse and to kind of put us into you know, more of this reverberation, Stripe actually invested right into Bear Metrics, which our one business and integration partner investing into our one competitor. We were like, oh, great, that's awesome. Uh, Tartmogo raised a bunch of money, and then eventually big companies, including Stripe themselves, got into the space as well. And this led to not a soul feeling, but a pretty long feeling of fuck, right? And what was scary about it is this is something as a bootstrap business that we were essentially banking our future on. We were so, so excited about it. And you've probably been in this situation in some particular manner. And so what we wanted to do is kind of freak out, just do a bunch of irrational things and just see what happens. But what we thankfully did, because we were working on this as a company, is we sat down and analyzed this. And the first thing that we discovered when we were collecting NPS data from our competitors' customers, as well as uh, customers of a bunch of different BI products, is we discovered, hmm, the NPS of the market is negative 15. And we thought, OK, the market isn't really that happy. So this is something that maybe we should continue to pursue this particular problem to actually go out and build a product for this space. And so we started to break it down, and not all of this happened in a picture-perfect you know, piece of paper or Google Doc, but we started to actually explore the problem rather than just building more stuff in order to kind of push into the market. And we looked at, all right, we're not going to be the most funded, we're not going to be the beautiful, most beautifully designed, but there might be something here rather than throwing a bunch of resources at it. So we started off, and what we found is one of the causes of being really, really difficult in this space is there's a real lack of willingness to pay for products like analytics. So we went out, we collected some data, we found out people really just don't want to pay for a lot of SaaS metrics, right? And when we broke down the market continually, what we started to find is that analytics products essentially exist on a spectrum that goes from data products, analytics products, or reporting products, products that help with insights, and then products that help with outcomes. And what we found is that on the left side of this particular graph, if you weren't an infrastructure product, you weren't really making that much money. And on the right side of the graph, you were actually really, really in a good place. Because willingness to pay as you went up this spectrum actually increased, and NPS also increased with the products that were further on the right of this particular spectrum. So that was super interesting to find out. Then we found out that no one was really happy with the accuracy of these products. We went out, we collected data from these individuals, and we found out as the company gets bigger, accuracy becomes more and more important. 
Some other causes of the problem here were we had no name recognition, at least in this space, and even then, not a lot of name recognition. Not a lot of money at all. And we also had a really, really behind product. And so we looked at this particular problem, we looked at the scope, and we figured out that we had a couple of solutions. One, we could just ultimately shut down and move on to something else. But because of what we found, the unhappiness, the problems that were out there, and those particular causes that played to our strengths, we ultimately went into a world where we made ProfitWell free. We focused on accuracy for 18 months, meaning no new features except just getting things to be accurate, which is a lot harder than you might think it is. And we committed to the mission of this freemium-driven product within this world. And then we started to execute on this particular continuum and work to push all of our paid products essentially to the outcomes and the insights piece. And so this was a problem that we had, one that most of the folks in the space handled by just kind of shipping stuff or going up market like every analytics product under the sun. We wanted to focus on what was the actual causes and where we could solve those particular causes. And for more, just on freemium in general, um, we have a free book. You can email me if you don't want to fill out the form. Don't worry about the form. Um, or you can find it at profitable.com slash freemium for just more information on kind of freemium in general. But the last thing I want to talk about is truth. And with this, I need to play a little bit of a game with the audience. It's a little bit of a psychological experiment. I'm going to force you guys to opt in. Don't worry, it's not too scary. But I'm going to show you a couple of prompts. And I want you to emotionally take into account how you feel about those particular prompts. If you believe them, if you don't believe them, if you're rooting for them, if you're not rooting for them. But just listen to your emotions for these next particular prompts. And keep in mind, I am the person that collected the data on this. I am the person that basically did all of the data cleansing. And if you've read any of our content, you know that I do fairly good work when it comes to that particular access but I'm the only source to the data you're about to see, besides the actual data. First up, founders who sleep less than five hours a night grow slower, their companies that is, than those individuals who sleep seven to eight hours per night. It's probably something that's relatively easy to agree with. There's been a lot of sleep studies out there. We've talked about it, we've tweeted about it, right? Next up. Companies with institutional funding have higher churn rates than those who are bootstrapped. And this one's probably a little bit harder to agree with, right? If you're bootstrapped, you're like, hell yeah, Patrick, let's go, right? If you're an investor, you're like, you don't know what you're talking about, Patrick, right? But here's the data. They tend to have much higher churn rates. Let's do another one. Founders with hobbies or who score high on a work-life balance index tend to have slower growing companies. Now some of you are really mad at me, right? Some of you are like, Patrick, how dare you publish this data? Does this consider children? Does this consider divorce rates? You want to go and attack this data, right? Here it is. Light green, folks who have no hobbies, their growth rates, and then we took out all the outliers, we controlled for the different sizes, we did all the common and pretty gritty good things. And then here's the data for those individuals who scored high on work-life balance in the dark green, and those who scored low on work-life balance in the light green. And then another one here. Remote companies have considerably worse growth and worse retention than those companies who are co-located. Now some of you want to murder me, right? Remote is a religion, right? Here's the data. They typically grow at least from $1 to $10 million in ARR, about 20 to 30% slower than those companies where everyone's in the same place. Now what's interesting about this is there's obviously, I'm not making a claim that you shouldn't be remote or you should you know, not have a life. But what's fascinating about this is that instead of going, well, there's nuance and there's trade-offs, it's okay to be remote and I'm okay not growing as quickly if I have the ability to hire from anywhere, a lot of you fall privy to what's called the backfire effect, which is basically the psychological phenomenon that when I present data or information that disagrees with your natural inclinations, you feel and your brain actually fires 
as if I was a giant bear that was actually attacking you. It's the exact same receptors within the brain that go off. And the problem is if you're a founder, you're an executive, and this is how you react to things. You only agree with the data or the information that supports your claims, you're screwed. Because there are so many things where you get hopped up on your vision, and in reality, those particular things aren't necessarily the pieces of your business that end up being the actual truth to what you're doing. And these are the things that cause you to react and overreact to your team. These are the things that cause you to ruin your personal lives with your loved ones or your friends. Because we don't look for truth, we simply look for the things that replicate the views that we already have. And so as a founder pursuing truth within a business, how do we do this? Well, the biggest thing that I can suggest is that you're not gonna be 100% about this in your business. Instead, you just have to work to get better at it. And the thing that's really, really helped me is this concept of the most charitable interpretation principle, which basically means that when someone comes to you with something, whether it doesn't sound that well thought out, whether it's a piece of data, whether it's an idea that you just inherently think is stupid, assume that they have good intent, assume that they're smart, and assume that they may be right. Now, we might get rid of all of those assumptions through a conversation, and that's totally fine, but at least start the conversation that way, because there's so many things that are gonna happen in your business, and when you continue to have all of those bad things happening and go through this freak-out cycle of executive emotion, you can't have 90% of your job going into this reverberation of, fuck, everything's terrible, right? Because all of us in our businesses are going to have really, really bad things that happen. And when we were on our journey to 10 million in revenue, this is a really pretty graph, but this is what it really looked like, right? And some of you that know me know that this wasn't the easiest path for, for ProfitWell or myself. I had first-time founder woes. I founded ProfitWell in literally the worst way possible. I made every mistake. Co-founders fully vested, not having all these other fun legal things in place, just every mistake under the sun. I had a major breakup that wasn't caused by the company, but definitely was like speeded along with the company, which was really, really fun. I all of a sudden had the reddest of oceans with all those competitors that I was talking about. And then what really kicked me in the face was a couple years into the business when we were in this stage where we had a little bit of something, but it was really, really fragile, I ended up getting cancer. And what sucked about that is that thankfully it was very, very treatable and everything's fine right now, but it was one of those things where everything was kicking me in the face, and it's not a contest. We've all had our share of Lifetime movies within our life, but it's one of those things that if you don't have the most charitable interpretation and you haven't worked on your patience, when life kicks you in the face and the company kicks you in the face, you're not going to be scalable if you don't think about things. And the thing that I found in pursuing truth is that you really have to look internally. Because when I was going through a lot of this stuff and talking to my founder or my mentors and my advisors, what I found is that the most common advice to these types of things, including cancer, by the way, which is a little weird what I'm about to show you here, but our most common advice to this type of stuff, you should meditate right? Because that's going to cure cancer, right? Or we go, hey, you got to work out and eat well, which, yeah, it helps. I know I need to get fitter, but still, there's a lot of stuff going on, right? And then my personal favorite, do you journal, right? Now, all of these things are good and all of these things are going to help you, but they end up treating the symptoms and they're only really, really mildly preventative. They're not actually going to help you at your core. And the reason that I have at least kept going, and the reason I think most people keep going in the face of things that are worse than what I went through and things that are less than I went through, is really understanding your why. And your why can't be, oh, I wanna make money, because there are so much easier ways to make money than founding a company. You typically learn that after you've started a company. But it's one of those things where you have to understand what do you want to achieve and why you're building what you're building. And this comes down to really knowing yourself. And frankly, this is like 
the softest advice I can ever give you, and it's very ironic coming from me because I'm so data focused the rest of my life, but it's one of those things that I didn't really unlock the ability to deal with all this bullshit and deal with all the things that happen in a company until I really looked into what I actually wanted. And what I actually wanted was to build a company that solved this problem better than anyone else and just really got to the final truth of subscription growth. And then what really helped me, because there's gonna be all types of bullshit that still happens within your company, is I surrounded myself with the right partners. And that took a good four years to find those people who, when all that fear is coming through and trying to basically break through to me and make me have a bad day, basically making sure that I had other people in the business who knew I was having a bad day and maybe were hopefully having a good day to kind of lift my spirits up. Then it took finding the right team, aligning along the right vision of what we all wanted. And then finally, and sometimes the most hard part about this, is finding the right family and friends around you. One of the things you don't really learn until a little bit later in life, still early in your life, but a little bit later, is that you can actually choose your friends. You can't really choose your family as much, but you can actually choose those folks who support you. And finding those that support your vision of what you're trying to do is probably one of the most helpful things that you can do for the lifetime of your business. And for me, the way I got here was a lot of introspection, a lot of like, I have no idea what I'm doing, a lot of just vulnerability, and then ultimately making sure that I consumed all of the advice and mentorship that I could find on that introspection, and then being unapologetic about what I wanted. And that's the number one piece. Too many of us ebb and flow between what we want based on the people around us, our investors, our advisors. You have to find your central confident truth of what you're trying to do. So two lessons, leverage and truth. And the last thing I'll leave you with is you are the only person that can solve this for yourself and ultimately as the steward of your company. And so with that, Here's my email address for the slides. If you want more, um, we have a ton of workshops on some of the stuff we normally talk about, about retention and pricing and things like that at our booth over here. But with that, thanks again. We'll see you.